Okay, so so my name is Denis Murman. So welcome to this, uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, I'm the uh, action chair of uh, Ghost Action Enota. Enota is uh, stands for European Network on Optimizing Treatment with Therapeutic Antibodies in Chronic Inflammatory Diseases. Okay, so what is a cost action? So this is just a, 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 remind, a reminder for those who are not acquainted with the cost uh, action. So it's essentially a, a networking activities so that are funded by a, a, a partly by the uh, European Union. And there are uh, at the moment more than uh, 300 uh, cost action. So there are 60 uh, projects a year and that lasts for four years. So it's a way to build a network and to um, make some relationship with uh, other scientists on a very specific topic. So cost of finance people who want, who want to get in contact with this other. So this, is a, uh, this is a quote from uh, the, the past, uh, the, the past uh, president of course, Alain Beret. So the challenge of ENOTA is to eliminate the barrier and, and raise awareness on the implementation of personalized use of therapeutic antibodies for chronic inflammatory disease. So it is very targeted on personalized uh, medicine. So we have uh, different uh, uh, participants who are the full uh, members, countries that you have seen on the previous slide. So this is the uh, all these uh, uh, court members. So uh, you have in blue uh, the non-inclusiveness target countries and in uh, purple you have the inclusiveness target countries. So uh, one of the mission of court association is also to favor those who have less mean uh, uh, to, uh, to, to uh, on the research. And so we have uh, been trying to have a balance between the two uh, the two uh, ITCs and non-ITCs countries. So the, the, the network, the ENOTA, has started uh, in uh, November, so two years ago almost, and it will uh, uh, finish on uh, in two years, so it's four years. Um, so we are organizing five working groups, so uh, we've not discussed everything, but uh, this is a patient classification, so what is the right treatment corresponding to uh, a, a given patient? So this is the right dose of working group two uh, that is uh, led by Erwin Dresden and uh, Elizabeth Nielsen, who are, by the way, the, the organizer of this webinar series. So it's the right dose to, to the right patient. The working group three is uh, on access to standardization and center structuring to make people speaking the same language when we are, uh, if we want to make uh, like a pan European clinical trial. And we have also a working group which is devoted on the cost effectiveness, acceptability, and implementation of therapeutic uh, drug monitoring and, and personalized medicine. And between, uh, among those uh, working groups, we have discrimination and sustainability working. So, uh, what can be funded by cost? So, cost does not finance research, it, it, it provides some, uh, some funding for. Uh, uh, essentially for meetings, for training school, and for what we call the SDSM, the short-term size mission, which is uh, an individual mobility. So we will release uh, in the coming weeks uh, the, the call for STSM, uh, and uh, it will be uh, in November, so it will give an opportunity for the, especially the young researcher to, to have uh, an elective, to have a, a mission for one month, two months, uh, in another country, uh, in another uh, host uh, laboratory. So I will finish with this uh, action website. Uh, so you will see uh, all the polls of the short term scientific mission, inclusive study country conference, etc. So do not hesitate to go uh, on the website. And I give the, the word back to the working group to uh, organizer of this webinar, Erwin. And Elizabeth. Thank you, uh, um, and uh, also welcome everyone on my behalf to uh, this month's Inota webinar. It's really nice to see so many familiar faces or names here. Um, 
In the past few months, we, we talked about uh, chronic inflammatory diseases, monoclonal antibodies, TDM, pharmacometrics, population models. And today we will talk about um, software tools for modeling from precision dosing. Um, these software tools are very important to, to leverage the population models uh, to optimize individualized uh, dosing of medications uh, can be in real time. Um, so they actually are a very transformative approach to precision medicine. And to talk about these topics, we invited two excellent speakers and experts in, uh, in this domain. And the first one is uh, Professor Sebastian Bicha uh, from the uh, University of Hamburg. He's a full professor um, of clinical pharmacy. Um, Sebastian gained uh, doctoral and postdoctoral experience at the University of uh, Berlin, also at the Pharmacometrics Research Group in Uppsala in Sweden. And his research group mainly focuses on uh, improving and individualizing treatment of anti-infectives based on PKP and pharmacometric models. And um, Sebastian is also known for developing the TD metrics software tool for model informed precision dosing. And I suppose we're going to hear more about that today as well. Sebastian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Erwin. Thank you very much, Dennis, for and all the organizers for the invitation. Just checking whether can whether you can see my screen. Yes, we see it. Perfect. OK, happy to talk about software tools for model informed precision dosing. Before I do that, quickly show you my disclosures, which are all unrelated to the present presentation. So before going into software, uh, software uh, tools, uh, let's quickly recap um, what we what we do and in which setting we want to use those software tools. Um, so in previous, semi uh, previous seminars and webinars, you have heard of uh, therapeutic drug monitoring. And conventionally, therapeutic drug monitoring is done in the following way, that a um, dose is given uh, to a patient of a specific medicine. Then um, a blood sample is taken, the drug concentration is, is measured as visualized here. And then this drug concentration is uh, compared to a therapeutic window with a minimal effective concentration and a minimal toxic uh, concentration. And um, well, the dose is, adjustment, is adjusted only if uh, the concentration lays outside of this window. Otherwise, uh, the dose is kept. Um, and uh, the treatment course is continued. Um, an evolvement of this classical TDM concept is the so-called target concentration intervention. So this part here in the beginning looks the same. You give a dose, you measure a drug concentration, but then instead of simply comparing that drug concentration um, to a target range, you define a specific target, and then you use um, pharmacological principles to optimize the dose um, in a way that the drug concentration reaches this target. So you aim for a target, and then you optimize the dose to reach that target. Now, um, how comes how can uh, model-informed precision dosing help here? Well, um, certainly to understand and integrate the knowledge uh, of the um, pharmacokinetics and to make those predictions that are visualized here by lines in this cartoon. And actually, the doses are optimized using both principles. Also, the, um, the approach on the left is being used in model-informed precision dosing tools so that you simulate dosing schemes, and then you compare the exposure that you get from those models to specific target ranges. That's, for instance, useful for drugs that have specific um, tablet strengths, where you cannot give um, a milligram scale dose. Um, or the right-hand side is used for drugs that can be dosed very precisely, for instance, that are given intravenously, uh, for instance, infliximab, which is dosed um, very on a very fine scale. Could where this approach could be used. When it comes to nomenclature, um, the picture is, uh, is uh, very diverse. Um, um, uh, it's not really unified which terms are being used for the processes I have showed to you. I will, in my presentation, stick to model-informed precision dosing, which is an overarching term summarizing the use of pharmacometric models um, in implemented in a precision dosing software to calculate individu individualized doses. 
And for this purpose, a number of uh, tools are available. This is a, a review from uh, actually uh, Erwin Driesen's group uh, that appeared a few years ago. Um, this list is not complete. There are more tools and uh, some are um, academic developments, um, others are commercial developments. Um, so this is really nice to see that there are so many tools available. So you don't have to you learn non-MEM or other more complicated um, uh, modeling softwares to actually do um, use MIPD in practice or um, understand these concepts. So what are the advantages of using um, model-informed precision dosing software as compared to the conventional approach? Um, well, you can actually already individualize um, the dose before you give the first dose um, by asking the software, what is the likely effective a dose that will um, uh, reach my target concentration or be within my target range? You don't need to wait for steady state to do dose adaptions. That's particularly useful for drugs where um, it's important to be in the therapeutic range as early as possible. Then you can use any timed sample as input um, to the POP-PK models. You don't have to use a trough concentration or a specific sample four hours after the dose. No, any timed sample can be used in this approach. And also already a single sample can be enough um, to estimate the full PK curve. And thereby you can maximize the prob probability of target attainment on the patient level. But there are some challenges also with this approach. So, um, I talked a lot about the model. Sometimes you have several models available. So which model shall you use for your individual patient? We are also looking into how to deal with instable patients and how to also include um, treatment response biomarkers into this workflow. Um, but in today's presentation, in these short 20 minutes, I will only focus on this part, uh, on the which model to use and show you some examples. So um, the underlying model, um, as you have learned before, um, is developed based on a, on a population. Here in this example could be the Springfield population. And then, um, as you have learned before in, in these seminars, we derive a population pharmacokinetic model, which has some specific uh, components. And then in model-informed precision dosing, we're using this model in the background to calculate a dose using dosing software for one individual of this population. So already here you can see um, uh, the individual patient and the population, they should share the same characteristics. If those two are very different from each other, also the underlying model may actually skew your dose predictions. So from this population pharmacokinetic model, what, what does dosing software use in the background? In the background, um, the Bayesian estimation takes place when uh, measured drug concentrations become available. So there's the patient level where you have the drug concentrations and then here um, the model prediction and um, the objective function, which is um, also in the background of the dosing software is trying to minimize the squared differences between the observations and the predictions. But at the same time, there's also the population level in the background. And here we know, for example, that certain pharmacokinetic parameters have a specific value which is very likely or which is less likely to occur in the population. And then the second term is a penalty term that penalizes when the model chooses a clearance parameter or a volume parameter, which is far away from this um, uh, population mean value. So that is a balance between the patient level and the population level. And to illustrate this a little bit, I, I think we can use a cartoon. I'm not sure if we have listeners from Germany. There is this uh, Sendung mit der Maus where um, there are always cartoons with this little mouse here and the elephant. And here um, they have a little fight. Uh, they pull the ropes in a tug war. And that's exactly what happens in a Bayesian uh, dosing software or in a model informed precision dosing software. So we have here in orange, the mouse, which is the patient data and the elephant, which is the population model. And you see the same colors here in the, on the left-hand side. So in blue is the population prediction. In orange is our um, patient sample. And then this is the um, Bayesian estimate of the individual pharmacokinetic profile for this patient. And then if we add more data, 
I'm flipping back and forth, you can see now how our individual prediction is moving closer to our samples. So the mouse is getting a little bit bigger. What you also see, and that's also a property of this approach, is that you will never be uh, on top of the data point with your prediction. You can get very, very close, but due to this uh, Bayesian uh, penalty term in the background, there's always this balance between the population prediction and the individual. And this is obviously very important. Um, we have done several um, uh, evaluations of model performance on retrospective data sets. Here you see an example of vancomycin, where we have here the bias, the uh, imprecision here, uh, different models that are available for vancomycin, and then different um, amounts of data that were provided to these models. And as you can see already from the start, uh, there's a very heterogeneous landscape of the predictive performance of these models. Most models improve when you provide more data, but some models perform certainly much better than others. Uh, in this evaluation, for example, the model from, model from Gauthier et al performed best and is also available in many model informed precision dosing softwares for vancomycin. But if you use um, vancomycin as continuous infusion, um, same population, still a general ward population, but just changing the mode of administration. Uh, the GOTI model here, uh, I've spotted it. It's uh, not the worst model, but it's also not the best model. Other models perform better. For instance, the model from Collin and Okada et al. And this was a bit <laughs> disappointing to us to see if you just change the mode of administration, already another model might perform better. And that was actually the motivation to come up with an automated approach uh, to ease this um, in, in a model informed precision dosing software, uh, which is a model selection or a model averaging approach. How does this work? So instead of estimating only a single model um, to um, a, the TDM data you have from a patient, uh, um, we estimate a set of candidate models. Um, and then uh, we evaluate the model fit. So models that um, fit the individual very well get a high um, weight. Those that do not fit that well get a lower weight. And then um, we can do two things. We can do an averaged um, prediction um, using these weights. So we use all the models together, but we calculate a weighted average, which is illustrated here by this black line. That is the averaging approach. Or another approach could be just to say the winner takes it all and we select only on the patient level the best fitting model. We um, evaluated um, this uh, algorithm for the first time in uh, also in vancomycin in a very heterogeneous data set of a mix of general ward and ICU patients. Uh, again, here precision, um, accuracy, the performance of the single models. You see some of the single models have um, quite a strong bias. And then in black, we see here the performance of the averaging approach, uh, right next to it, the selection approach. And we always got um, an unbiased result here. And also the uh, imprecision was rather low. And we even notably performed better um, as this GOATI model, which uh, performed quite well in one of the other evaluations. And we have gained quite some experience with this approach um, in different settings for different drugs. Also for infliximab, I want to highlight this one a little bit more um, due to the um, Enota webinar today. So this was work that was done by uh, uh, Vani uh, Kantaziri Pitak and Erwin Dresen in Leuven, where they also looked at different models uh, for infliximab and also could show that um, this model averaging approach using um, also individually not well-performing models, when you use them together, you can um, get a, a decent um, a prediction. And that makes the use um, of these models in practice much easier if you don't have to come up with a decision tree and you have to uh, decide upon yourself which model is best, but if the software can actually help you uh, to do this. Now we have talked a bit about the theory. I just want to show you uh, in the last couple of minutes how um, such a workflow using a model informed precision dosing software in reality could look like. And I'm showing this uh, to you with our TDMX software, which is an educational tool 
um, uh, where you can try out model informed precision dosing approaches. Uh, when you open the software, um, the software is divided into, well, I would say three panels. On the left-hand side, there's an input panel. So all sorts of input variables um, can be put in here. Then you have here a, wind, um, a view pane where uh, the, uh, visu um, the input is directly visualized. And then here in the lower end, you have a table where some numeric results are being presented. So we would start with our patient here uh, called um, Mrs. Enotta. We would enter the patient data. Um, uh, here we have some laboratory parameters uh, that we would enter. And then um, this patient in, in this example already has gotten a dose here as of today um, at 12 o'clock. Um, and uh, this is directly visualized. Now, um, if we would um, look a bit into the future, maybe uh, in this patient TDM would be done. And then here um, in November, uh, this patient uh, would undergo a TDM measurement and a, a concentration of infliximab of 10 milligrams per liter uh, would have been uh, taken. And that's then visualized here. So then we can ask the software uh, to come up with the individual pharmacokinetic um, parameter estimates. And therefore we would have to tick on individual. And then this orange line here appears, which shows us the um, estimation of the individual pharmacokinetic profile. And here on the lower part, you also get the pharmacokinetic parameters. Now uh, we can also tick variability and then um, uncertainty bands are added that can help um, to visualize um, variability. So you see here in blue, that's the population prediction uh, for our patient where the uh, TDM sample is not considered. Uh, so there is still variability, or more variability. And when we consider the TDM sample, you can see that the uncertainty bands become much more narrow. Now in this uh, lower pane here, you see the PTA, that's the probability of target attainment. Here we have um, defined a target of five milligrams per liter. That's the minimum concentration. We do not want to uh, fall below to uh, maintain um, the efficacy of the drug. And we can see if we would hover here in the software over this part that well by end of November, we would have a high chance that um, we fall below um, this um, uh, concentration threshold. So, and then um, in the dosing tab, we could then ask the software to come up with an optimized dosing schedule. And for instance, here we could um, maintain um, the dosing interval of um, 42 uh, days, um, but we could use um, a lower dose in this patient. Instead of 350 milligrams, we could go down to 250 milligrams. So we would save some drug but we could still allow um, for a um, uh, 42 days interval. Of course, one could also do other things. One could keep the dose high and extend the interval. Both is um, possible. So just for an illustration how um, simple it actually is to use a dosing software to come up with an optimized dose. And I've previously spoken about this model averaging approach. So here, uh, what we have done here now, we used a single model that is accessible in this patient tab. So that was the model from Auburg. Uh, we could also have clicked here on auto select, then the software would have selected the best model for an individual patient. Now, if we want to use the model averaging, we would just go to this model averaging tab. And now it looks a little bit more technical what we see, but the workflow would have been exactly the same. Uh, we just now see also the individual predictions from those candidate models in different colors. And then in black, this weighted average prediction across all those candidate models. And here we can see um, uh, the distribution of those weights. Well, here four models have a very similar distribution, but the model from Turnant and Al in, in, in yellow here got the uh, tendency to have the highest weight. If you want to read more about this, how to use the um, model averaging approach in dose calculations, I would like to recommend you to uh, read another paper here from the Leuven team uh, where they also uh, Im evaluated a model averaging approach and that's also available in, in TDMX uh, for children. 
um, where you see here two examples. Um, the first example is an, a dose increase um, that was performed here or here uh, where a top-up dose was calculated to reach um, a target concentration that was defined later at week um, 12. Um, yes, so to conclude, um, I hope I could show you that uh, model-informed precision dosing can streamline dosing decisions and you can calculate a likely effective first dose. You don't need to wait for steady state. You can technically use any timed sample um, to predict um, doses and estimate the PK parameters uh, just from a single sample. And those automated algorithms may help um, to ease um, the workflow in, in MIPD software. Yet there are challenges for further research. Um, one is very important. Um, if we want um, uh, to implement MIPD, we also need clinical trials that show the benefit of individualized dosing approaches over standard of care. Otherwise, it will be very difficult to convince funders uh, to go into this direction. Also looking into integration of biomarkers. More technical is also to see if um, the emerging machine learning algorithms can actually help to enhance the pharmacometric um, models. And lastly, uh, the electronic health record implementation uh, that you don't have to enter all the things yourself, uh, but this uh, is done in the background and the data is sourced um, from an electronic health record, which can also substantially help to ease the workflow. And there uh, we will hear more, I guess, in the second presentation from Ron, who have a commercial software and have actually achieved this in, 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 their, in their software package. And lastly, also legal aspects, the medical device regulation. Um, our software is, uh, is a research tool. We have now made it uh, into a medical device within our institution here in Hamburg, in our medical center as an in-house medical device. This has been uh, incredibly difficult and challenging and also actually quite boring from a scientific perspective, but the hurdles are actually very high to do this, this type of research and is certainly a challenge uh, for implementation uh, from the research perspective. If you want to read more about model informed precision dosing, I would advertise uh, this article uh, that has just came out uh, a few days ago, uh, which is um, summarizing the state of the art and future perspectives of MIPD, uh, also from the technical perspective, but also goes into several um, uh, indications and inflammatory bowel diseases is one of them. So thank you very much for your attention. And I also want to thank uh, our collaborators and team members and funders who make our research possible. Thank you very much, Sebastian, for a very clear and nice presentation. Uh, I especially like this cartoon with the <laughs> mouse and the elephant sort of competing over the fit to the data, which was really nice. Thanks. So, thank you very much. Uh, so we will save the questions to the end of the webinar. And uh, thus is it my great pleasure to welcome the second speaker in this webinar, Ron Kaiser. So Ron is a pharmacometrician, he's a pharmacist and also a software engineer. And he has a special passion for developing tools to improve drug dosing in patients. So he has held various academic positions and also authored several commercial and open source softwares uh, in the pharmacometrics field. And he is the co-founder and also the chief scientist of InsideRx, which is a San Francisco based company developing precision dosing softwares. So Ron, over to you. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, let me know if, you, if you're if you not able to hear me um, or see the slides. <clears throat> um, yeah, just to get this out of the way, a disclaimer, I, I work for a, um, a commercial company. Um, and uh, in this talk, I'll, I'll talk a bit about the history. Uh, there's there's going to be a little overlap with um, the previous talk, but not too much. Uh, then I'll talk the um, in sort of a block about um, regulatory aspects. I, I think it's it's good for this group to to, uh, to learn about those. Uh, and then a little bit about EHR integration, and then I'll give my outlook on where this this field is uh, is going next. In in my view, um, yeah. So uh, you already saw a, an example of um, of an MIPD software tool uh, in the previous presentation by uh, Sebastian. This is our implementation. It's a cloud based uh, web application. 
uh, like like Sebastian, it's based on uh, PK models, PKPD models sometimes, um, and it's integrated in the in the clinical workflow. Also integrated um, with a bit of the hospital systems, and that I'll I'll uh, explain that more in detail later. Um, before that, um, I want to do a little bit of a of a history tour uh, where this field um, uh, has come from. Um, um, so this this kind of got started in the 70s and 80s, long time ago. Um, and uh, the first versions of this were really uh, tools like NOMAM and UC Pack and a few others uh, that that were developed uh, on the command line back then. Of course, there was no there was not even Windows or, or things like that. So uh, this was really a tool um, mainly for scientists that uh, the ones to to use these tools. They were, the initial aim was actually to use them at the point of care, uh, but yeah, the the use was very limited. Not not usable by um, by most um, uh, clinicians. Then there was sort of a second wave in the nineties and um, uh, uh, zeros uh, of of this um, century. Uh, tools like MW Farm uh, fr from Holland, um, TDMS two thousand from uh, San Diego, um, and the best those from um, Los Angeles. Uh, they were already easier to use. Uh, they were aimed at, at mostly at pharmacists, uh, maybe maybe some um, enthusiast medical doctors, but they were really aimed uh, not as a sort of a general purpose uh, modeling tool, but really uh, for optimizing the dose. Um, so that was sort of a second wave. They were not super easy to use yet. You still had to yeah do a lot of manual uh, labor to to get them to work, but uh, it it was uh, for sure an improvement. And then really the third wave, that's sort of where we are now, uh, the last 15 years where there's these new applications, mostly web-based tools um, uh, that are uh, also integrated with the, the hospital records mostly. Uh, they're user-friendly and they're really aimed at any, I would say any clinical pharmacist, any uh, medical doctor that, that's, that knows a little bit about PK. Um, and I, th I think... Um, What's also new is that these tools have now been adopted more or less by um, professional societies. If you read the guidelines for vancomycin, they actually call out specifically that um, if you want to do it in the optimal way, you should use um, you should use these tools. So that's that's for the first time I think um, that that that's happened. And yeah, these these tools are just just getting easier and easier uh, every every year basically. Um, yeah, so MIPD um, software. So MIPD also as a field has been growing uh, for the last 10 years. Uh, there's a, every year there's more um, publications about this. Uh, so yeah, the, the whole field is getting uh, is getting more, uh, more and more um, recognition and more um, research being done. So that, that's that's a really good sign, I think. Yeah, so then stepping into the regulatory aspects, um, the question that's been asked uh, to me and to others a lot is, uh, is, is this software a medical advice? Um, and yeah, as a, as a good scientist, the, the answer is uh, it depends. Um, also, I want to disclaim this, uh, this next section by, uh, look, I'm, I'm not a, a legal scholar. I'm a scientist. So this is just what I've learned and how I understand things. But please uh, do not take this as the final advice if you're looking into uh, this, this, this stuff. Um, so the first thing that uh, is important to know, there is a big difference between the U.S. and Europe. So um, in the in the U.S., sorry, in the U.S., um, if you read the um, uh, the guidelines or the regulatory documents, and I've listed a few here, uh, you can find that a tool like this is called a software as a medical device, and that software that's intended to be used for medical purpose. And that's not, and that's not part as a of a of a hardware medical device. So, um, yeah, we, we fall in that bin, but that's not the whole. That's not the whole story, um, because they they do make um, a carve outs for software that they don't consider medical devices. So, if you read more closely the the um, uh, the regulatory documents, they give four criteria, and if you adhere to all four criteria you're actually not counted as a medical device. And um, so if you're uh, not analyzing a medical image or a signal from, an, uh, from a hardware device, which we're not really doing, 
uh, then you 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 may um, then then you sort of belong to the gather uh, that a category. If you're intended for this, the purpose of displaying, analyzing, or printing medical information, which we're doing, then you, that that's also good. So, if you're intended for providing recommendations to a healthcare professional about prevention, diagnosis, or treatment, uh, then you also apply to this um, category. And the last one is actually the most important one, I think, because that's that's where it gets a little tricky. Um, if you're intended for enabling such healthcare professionals to independently review the basis for recommendations from the software, then you actually fall in this category and you're not a medical device. So the last point is very important because um, once you cross the line to, for example, uh, black box machine learning models where uh, you, um, you have the input and you show the output, uh, let's say a dose or something, that's... Uh, I think that's a violation of that that last um, um, line. Um, so then you would actually move over into becoming a medical device, and you fall. Yeah, you have to do um, uh, quite a bit more in terms of your um, um, equality system and um, things like that. So we are in the US uh, at the moment not a medical device, but these things might change. Regulations can always change. Um, we might change our ways. Um, so that that's the, but that's the situation at the moment. Uh, and this this is not this doesn't, doesn't apply it only to us. All also every other um, software in the US that's on the market uh, also has the same is is in the same boat basically. Then going to Europe, um, in Europe uh, it's it's slightly different. Um, up until twenty twenty one, there was uh, something called the medical device directive. Uh, which was the previous uh, regulatory framework, but things are moving now to the medical device regulation, which is has been active from uh, uh, 2021, actually a little bit before even. Um, but that change is important because um, um, the, the the new regulations are are way more strict than the the old ones, um, and um, because it's hard for um, um, software vendors to move over to these new regulations. The, um, uh, the European Union has actually said, okay, we will grant every uh, software that, that was put on the market before 2021. Uh, you can still market your, um, your device, your, your software until 2028. So we, we have some time to move over to the new system. Uh, but it, yeah, uh, the expectation is that Still, a lot of um, softwares uh, when we get to twenty twenty eight are are not going to be ready, uh, and will actually be uh, removed from the from the market if um, if the rules don't uh, change. So that's something to to um, yeah to perhaps worry about. Um, so and that's also uh, if you look at um, the number of MIPD software tools that are currently available under this. Um, framework that's now active is exactly zero, um, uh, to the best of my knowledge. I, I don't know any tool that's, that is already uh, registered un under uh, this new regulation. Um, under the old regulation, uh, including us, uh, there's about four softwares that are available. There might be uh, one or two more. I, I, yeah, I don't claim to, to know everyone, but, uh, but uh, this is what I think uh, the number is. Um, and they these are still um, they will still be active until uh, twenty twenty eight, and then um, yeah every uh, vendor has to move over to this new new framework. Um, the the main difference in this new framework compared to the old is that class one, at least for software, uh, has um, disappeared. So in the previous framework, every software basically uh, unless it was high risk was uh, classified as um, class ones. Um, and class one is, is the lowest form of um, uh, regulatory scrutiny. That means that you can uh, self-certify. You still need to do quite a bit. It's not that you're completely off the, off the hook and it's a wild, wild west. No, you still have to do a lot of things, but it's it's self-certify. You don't get audits. Um, it, it's, it, it's quite a lot easier. But now um, with the new regulations, uh, a lot of extra things ha have to be done. Uh, and it's very costly, um, so that's why uh, uh, the expectation is that a lot of softwares uh, won't actually make it uh, to, to, to the new framework. Um, about this classification, the class uh, the classes are, so they start at 2A, which is 
where I think most of uh, the MIPD softwares would land. Uh, perhaps for use at the ICU or in yeah high risk patients, and if the uh, the clinician really depends on your software to make a decision, it will be two B and perhaps maybe in some cases even class three, uh, but that really depends on the um, on the software and the application. Uh, but but I think mostly uh, also for IBD it will be class two A. Um, so. Let's step then into uh, something that I think is 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 also very important uh, for these new class of softwares is that um, they are hooked up with um, the, the EHR and the EHR is the electronic health records, um, so the, the hospital system. Um, and and why is that important? Of course, um, yeah, there is um, uh, there's a large gain in efficiency. Um, and, and I'll, I'll show an example in the next slide that uh, basically all the data that uh, for that patient is is automatically transferred uh, to the software. So you don't have to enter any data. You just have to do a manual check if 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 every, everything looks good. Um, so that's that's a that's that's a massive gain. Uh, it's less error prone. Hopefully, uh, I should add that it, uh, if the data comes from the EM, EHR, it doesn't necessarily mean that everything's correct. You still need to check. Is, there could always be a dose that is uh, in the system but hasn't actually been administered uh, or 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 or, or the, the other way around so there's there's all, all kinds of things that still could go wrong but it's 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 a lot faster if you just have to do some uh, some manual checking uh, rather than having to enter all these all these data um yeah so also the ability to transfer more than just the uh, sort of the, um, the height and the weight and the creatinine uh, just, just to, if, if you're able to add, uh, to transfer all the data from the patient that's known, so so all the labs, all the genetics, uh, things like that, you can you can make better models. Uh, you can make, and in the end, you can you can also make better predictions. That's um, that's the idea, uh, and especially, uh, yeah, when we start applying machine learning models, this this becomes even more important. Um, yeah, and, the, and then the last thing that's sort of an outflow of that is that uh, once you get more data in, uh, that, that sort of enables automated learning. Uh, and in the, the last few slides, I'll, I'll um, later I'll have a few more um, things to say about that. Um, but this is how it looks. Uh, so the um, sort of the border here, the, the blue part is the hospital system. In this case, it's, uh, it's, it's called EPIC. Uh, and that's, uh, that's where the, the clinician is, the pharmacist or the medical doctor. And in inside Epic, um, if they use our system or they use another system, that they will they will have a button that says uh, "Open this patient in uh, inside the rigs or in in a, in, a, in in the other system." Uh, and if they click that, then uh, this this main part of the screen will change, and our uh, UI will will open up. So they have everything in, in one system in one window. It's not like there's a separate pop up, and it's still um, you still need to to, um, to yeah uh, move back and forth. Everything is is all there. Everything's in, in a single window. So it's very easy for the clinician to um, to look at the patient's data, uh, make an adjustment, um, yeah, get the, get the advice from the software, uh, and then put that advice back in into the um, into the medical records. Um, yeah, so historically, this this has been difficult. Um, there have have been uh, what I call one off integrations. Uh, I think uh, since twenty years, maybe even longer, uh, where it's usually just one uh, um, one person that uh, sort of uh, is is very enthusiastic about it, and in in their hospital they. Uh, make this link with with the lab system or something. So these things have been happening, uh, but they have not been happening at scale. It's usually one hospital uh, that that has been doing this, and it it's it's a lot of work to make that work inside your hospital. Uh, but again, the, those scripts are not something that you can just um, transplant uh, to 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 another hospital. Uh, but things have changed uh, since about maybe five, six, seven years. Um, there have been um, uh, app stores uh, from the main EHR vendors uh, in the US. That's Epic and Cerner. In uh, in Holland, there's there's Chipsoft. In uh, that there's one in Belgium. I am sort of blanking on the name, but there's there's um, there's a lot of these these vendors, and they they now have um, they basically open up their 
uh, their internal uh, systems to uh, for uh, for other parties to hook into, and that makes it a lot easier. Uh, that's also how how we integrate um, in the US. So that's 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 a good development. Um, another way to integrate is through third party vendors. Um, yeah, the main one in the US is Redox. Uh, in in Europe, there's there's a company called Founder Health um, that that is doing this. Where uh, instead of uh, the if you're making uh, software that, and you have to integrate with every uh, single uh, EHR uh, that 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 will be harder. They say, okay, we do those integrations. You just integrate with us. So it's sort of a layer between the software and the hospitals, uh, which in theory makes it easier. Uh, but yeah, our experience uh, was not so good with um, uh, when we actually tried that, that. There was still a lot of hassle, and uh, so that's why we integrate um, directly with uh, the EHRs. But these these uh, third parties are, are also getting better and better. So that's 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 for sure something to look into. Um, yeah, I wanted to highlight some uh, challenges uh, for um, integration of MPD, MIPD. Um, and so this is an article we wrote uh, about six years ago uh, with, with some colleagues. And uh, what we highlighted then were more the scientific challenges. Uh, these were sort of the, um, the summary of those. Uh, things like model selection, model, model qualification, we highlighted then as a, yeah, as a big challenge. And uh, you, you saw the work from um, uh, Sebastian. Uh, he's, he's done some great work in that regard. Uh, also, 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 Erwin, uh's group has has done uh, quite a bit in in, the, in that. Uh, we, we've also done some work that so that 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 has really developed. We we know now how to um, yeah to select models, how to um, uh, qualify models, things like that. So that's that's going very well. I think that's not a not much of a challenge anymore. Um, of course, there's always more work to be done. Uh, improving predictive value that's sort of related to uh, the, the model selection. Uh, that I think uh, we, we're making good improvements there. Handling changes over time in the patient, in the individual patient, that's still a, sort of a challenge. Uh, I, I think there's more to be done there. Um, interrogation viability, uh, how to include that. There's still some uh, some questions to, to answer there, but there there have been some uh, some developments there. But I think. Um, the bigger hurdles are not so much scientific, uh, at least um, uh, to to get these softwares in the hands of clinicians. The bigger hurdles are more um, a practical. Um, a funding for software is one of the biggest one, because uh, as I explained, these are um, web-based hosted uh, solutions integrated with the EHR, regulated. So all of these things cost money to to develop and, and host. So that's that's not an easy uh, and, and cheap um, thing, and uh, yeah, like I said, historically these tools have been either free or uh, fairly low cost because yeah, there was no EHR integration, there was no uh, regulations. Uh, so uh, a lot of hospitals now have to to switch from a almost free solution to a um, paid solution, and that's that's uh, for some hospitals that's that's um, yeah that, that's that's hard. Uh, the second hurdle, perhaps in some fields, is um, uh, to get the evidence that you need. Uh, for some drugs, we we have plenty of evidence. Uh, I think for vancomycin, busulfan, there's, there's plenty of evidence. I don't think we need uh, more there. Uh, but for other drugs, um, maybe also in 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 IBD, uh, we could still use some more evidence to to support this. Um, uh, yeah, to um, yeah, to 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 make sure that uh, it's very clear that uh, these tools can actually help. Uh, improve uh, the patients. Uh, and then the last part is regulations. Uh, yeah, this what, what I what I spoke about earlier. Uh, especially in Europe, regulations are getting stricter. I only talked about medical device regulations, but there's also privacy regulations that's slightly stricter in, in Europe than in the US, uh, although that's, that's not the biggest hurdle, I would say. Um, but also on the horizon, or it, uh, it's actually already there. Uh, machine learning uh, regulations are also um, they're applied now in in Europe. If if we would move um, towards uh, applying more machine learning methods instead of uh, PK methods, uh, that that will be also um, a thing to look at. So this is uh, sort of the outlook uh, for what I think it, it will happen to this field. I think. Uh, we're going to incorporate data from more sources. At home sampling is already something that's being looked at uh, that, that will come, especially in 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 
IBD um, continuous monitoring on a patch, for example, uh, that that you just just put put on a patient and uh, do a readout. Um, perhaps not so much in IBD, but in um, yeah, for example in the ICU that could be very useful. Uh, that, uh, that's already happening, and it's it's it might be closer than you, than you think it is. In a few years, we will have that available um, uh, for use. Uh, then the underlying statistical methods, we will probably, well, we're already seeing more machine learning um, uh, papers come out, but there's there's a, there's a lot of caveats there. Um, these methods are not always uh, better. Uh, they're black box. Uh, they, yeah, they get higher scrutiny from, from, uh, from, from the re regulatory bodies. Um, and also the quality I think uh, at the moment, um, if you look at the, um, the articles that are out there, is um, uh, is sort of uh, far variable. Far there's 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 really good papers out there, but it's also um, some that there are they're not so good. Um, yeah, other other uh, methods that could be uh, useful are PBPK models that are uh, that sort of take uh, the PK models uh, sort of a next step where you add, uh, you basically, instead of using an empiric model, it's, it's really um, modeling the PK uh, using things like blood flows and um, protein binding and, and really sort of a mechanistic understanding of what happens in the body. And those, those there have been some case reports of this being useful for individualized dosing. But it's uh, at scale. I think this is still um, problematic. Uh, but I, I think that there is a future for those those models as well. And that the last uh, thing here is sort of sort of hybrid models. For example, machine learning combined with P PK models, where you get the best of both worlds. That that's uh, that's something that's also coming. Uh, yeah, this this will move into um, to other fields as well. Uh, oncology is is one I I, I still hope it, it will uh, will also adopt this. Uh, soon, uh, we're working on anticoagulation. Um, CAR T cells. I have uh, I have hopes for in the future that we will help there as well. Um, yeah, and uh, maybe the last aspect here: um, a continuous learning. Uh, we, we, there's something that we're working hard on because we get a lot of data in. Um, yeah, we we do um, uh, a few hundred thousand patients a year, so that all the data. Uh, is is also informing your model, so you can improve your models over time, um, and that's 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 something that we have to do. I think as a field, uh, so that that um, th that we we don't lose that data. Basically, um, I had a slide on that, but um, maybe I should skip it because it's um, it's uh, it's about time. Um, but I'm happy to answer answer any questions. Info. Thank you so much, uh, Ron Sebastian, for these uh, excellent talks. Very interesting. Um, that means the floor is open for questions. So uh, if anyone in the audience I see raised hands. Nick, Nick is a Go ahead. To a question. Maybe Nick or start. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sebastian and Ron. I really, I really, really enjoy your, your talks. I think you you really put your fingers on all the important issues except one, which is my question. Or my one of the challenges, Ron, that, that you didn't mention was the challenge of identifying the target concentration. Um, and I, I'll illustrate that with the the awful use of trough concentrations, which the trough concentration is the worst possible time to learn about the effect of a drug. So deciding whether which for determining what the what the effective concentration is. Because all the concentrations at steady state are higher than the trough. So if you measure the, you put all your faith in trough concentrations, you're ignoring all the rest of the concentrations that have occurred. So it's just uh, pharmacologically illogical uh, to do that. It's traditional, but it's a tradition that I think we should aim to try and change. And related to that is, is uh, the sampling issue. When do you take the samples? Sebastian said, oh, you can just take one concentration, you can learn about the curve. Well, you can, but you probably can't learn very much. And probably the worst time to, to sample is at the trough. So uh, I think the challenges are educational to educate people to think about uh, a, a, better a better target, 
uh, my my favorite target is the average steady state concentration or area under the curve or a dosing interval if you wish um much better than a trough so I'd, I'd be interested in your comments about how to educate people to use more intelligent uh, target concentrations yeah I, I i agree with what you just said so um uh i i think we should move off of troughs as much as we can um and i think it, there there is um uh, also in 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 in, in the ibd there there is a move towards that there is uh, interest in AUC dosing um i think in in um vancomycin dosing for example that has already happened uh mm -hmm. the the major guidelines they they recommend AUC do a dosing but yeah it, it that has to move over to other fields as well i agree yeah, maybe I can chime in here. I fully agree, Nick. Um, also for vancomycin, um, it has been shown um, from us and also others that actually the early samples are even better to estimate the AOC. It's not the trough. Well, you can get an AOC from the trough, but the precision and the accuracy is better if you if you sample earlier or mid-interval. Um, I hope really that um, it, it's very difficult to change a paradigm. Um, but I, I think Ron um, alluded to it that we might see those biosensors, those patches in the future that will actually continuous, continuously measure the drug concentration in the interstitial fluid. This is really around the corner, I think, and that hopefully will help um, to find more meaningful uh, metrics. Um, could be the AUC, could be average concentrations. It's also drug dependent, what is the best measure, of course, uh, but that could help to, to overcome this. But I would just say that I think rather than biosensors, what we need are brain transplants. <laughs> so all yeah, the people have... that believe in trough concentrations need a brain transplant. And yeah. we call it education, but that just to come back to the educational aspects. Thank you, uh, Nick. Uh, we have one, one or two questions. So James uh, from the Working Group 3. So. Fantastic presentations. Thanks so much. Uh, I remember as a junior doctor trying to have bloods to help guide antibiotic prescribing, but quite often in hospital, uh, the bloods were done at the wrong time. Um, and I don't think that that's going to particularly change. Um, I wanted to ask how good is the software now for adjusting for the timing of when bloods were done and what or when the next dose should be? It's a very good practical question and a challenge that many think is a challenge, but actually the challenge is the documentation. So as long as you document um, the, the time um, that you uh, had the blood draw, um, you can, as I said, you can take more or less any time sample, um, but here really documentation is key, I would say. Yeah, so a documentation of the dosing time and um, the sampling time, uh, and then you can use it in an MIPD software. Well, come on, you can't have it both ways. You you just agree to get a more precise estimate if you take if you don't take troughs, you take them at an earlier time. So you should document to people don't take trough concentrations in order to for the sample. That's the that's the first thing to do. I would say that's uh, in the future the the right approach to move away uh, what's from wrong the trough. With today? But um, what's wrong with right today? now, what's wrong with the last, Nick, uh... may I may I finish? Yeah. Yeah. Right now, uh, we have many of the targets um, defined as trough. So I think what first needs to happen is to to def redefine those targets and then move away from the trough. But as of today, um, that's the situation we are in, and we need to change that. Yes, but. Um, any time sample can be used in an MIPD software. I would not yeah, um, you, 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 say you're something You're mixing different. up two things. You, it's the big error is to mix up the target concentration with the time of the measured concentration. And you've just done I that. I did not mix this up, Nick. You, you did mix them up. Nope. You did mix them up. You kept talking about the target concentration and I, the point I was making about the time of the sampling. Okay? And, and I think that was up. James' so just, question. Okay. about the time of the sampling, if we can handle different sampling times. And that's possible. That was that was this part of the answer. And yes, I agree. There's the other part of the You can handle them, but we need to educate people to take them at better sampling times. Yeah, the I trough. agree. It's the, so it's, that's the some, big error. Sorry to interrupt. We do have some questions in the chat as well. And uh, the first one is, uh, I think, directed towards Ron. Of course, it's a bit worrying uh, about the regulations that will come. 
in the EU. So what would you need in order to change the software so that it fulfills the new requirements? Is it a big task? Do you think that would be possible or? Yeah, it, it's certainly possible, but it's it's mostly a lot of um, documentation work. Uh, of course, that's, that's not what we love to do. We, we love to do science and make software. Uh, so it's just uh, we have to hire people to to do that, uh, and that that costs money. And uh, we have to. Um, uh, it's required now that that you 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 actually get an audit from uh, from an external party. So that that costs money too. So um, I it, it, it's the the money required to move make that move is uh, at least um, like two hundred thousand um, uh, euros, something like that. And then every year. There's something like sixty to hundred k uh, extra, uh, so that that's 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 costly, and the margins in this um, in this field in the in the in the software are are not big. It's we're not making <laughs> reams of money here, so it's uh, yeah the, uh, the that's that's basically it. It it it's it, it's very challenging to stay in Europe um, with 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 the situation at at hand. Yeah. I guess it is time to close this webinar. So I'll let uh, the chair make the conclusion, Erwin or Petan. Sure, so I think I want to thank everyone for, uh, yeah, for the very lovely discussions. Uh, I, I, very interesting topics have been touched upon. There were more questions in the in the chat. Um, I will share them with the speakers. Um, maybe if we can uh, direct response to the people who ask the questions. And uh, of course, I also want to thank the speakers of today. Uh, it's really a very nice session. And then I hope to see you all back in a month. And let's see, 12th of November that will be. And then we will talk about um, experiences with MIPD and the role of analytics. Um, so things we talked about today as well. So I invite you all again, then we'll have two speakers, Silvia and Nuri, who are also members of uh, Inota. Thank you all. And, uh, Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye.